Hi, I'm Dr. Tamika Wagstaff. I work at Rochester Institute of Technology with college students, and my son Mason is in third grade at Frizz. And I'm Dr. Marla Washington. Um, I am, I've got a couple of hats I wear. I wear a couple of hats. Uh, so one of the hats is diversity uh, consultant here at the district, at the Brighton Central School District. Um, also pastor of Seneca United Methodist Church in Aranaquai, so it's good to be here. Can you identify a, a black or a brown person who has been an inspiration to you mm -hmm. in your life and explain if, you know, a little bit about who they are and mm -hmm. what they mean to you? Yeah, I could name many. I think um, one would be my mother. Um, being a, a single black mom, working hard, going to college at the same time I was going to college. Um, she's an educator, a teacher, she teaches special education, um, and just really devoting her life to to her work, to her children, um, to education, and to making sure that she leaves generations that have come after her better than than where they were. Um, and second, I would say in, in the most present for me would be Michelle Obama. And I think just being a woman, a strong black woman who was able to walk in her skin and walk in who she was and walk in her purpose without changing herself um, to fit the world's kind of view of who she should have been or who she should be. Um, and just all the wonderful things that she did, especially as it impacts children, um, school lunch programs, making sure that you have healthy food to eat, making sure that you're getting exercise and getting outside. Um, all of those things are, are so important. You know, and for me, um, there were two men, two very important men in my life. Um, both of them are ministers, pastors. And um, the first one happened to be my father in the ministry. And, and this person is the one who birthed me into, into ministry. Um, I'll never forget, on the deathbed of my father, my actual biological father, my biological father shared with then our pastor, who is my father in the ministry, take care of Marlo. So he said, he said, I need you to do me a favor, and I need you to take care of Marlo. And the Reverend S. Frank Emanuel um, promised my dad on his deathbed and announced that to our congregation, which was a big church in Harlem. Um, that he's going to do just that. He paid my college tuition. He took care of me and my mother and my family. Um, when, because my father died when I was very young, when I was only 15, which left me, my sister, my brother, and my mother. And um, so when I say, as Frank Emanuel, this man was my all. To this day, I think about him every single day of my life and how he has influenced me and really helped me and really gave me uh, my, my, my identity in terms of the ministry. But then there's another man also in the ministry, his name is, and they're both dead, the Reverend O'Neill Mackey Sr. is his name, and he was what I call my theological dad. He, he kind of gave me the theological route um, to seminary and really uh, ushered me into that world. Um, when he had died in 20, uh, 2013 or something like that, his wife gave me all his robes. So mm -hmm. I have all of his robes in my house. And, I, and, um, and, and before I became a doctor, because he's a doctor, I didn't use it, and then now I'm using it, you know, because of him. And, but these two men were, were, were very, very important in my development and my upbringing as a young, young minister Mm -hmm. um, and working through the ranks of the church, and um, they they were there for me uh, through and through. Hi, okay. I'm Kaya Larkin, and I'm a sophomore. I play basketball, and I love sports. Um, and if you were to identify a black or brown person that was a great influence in your life or somebody that you, you look up to, who would it be? And can you explain a little bit about who they are? Because our, our third through fifth graders might not know. And then why? Well, um, in my life, a big influence has been my aunt, actually, my aunt Jordan. And she um, she's a very strong young lady. And she was a athlete in college and high school. And just seeing her really push forward, like always trying to be better and strive for the win, like she ran track. 
So I think that's just really motivated me. And she was also like valedictorian in college. So that's just such a great achievement. And definitely, she's definitely a role model for me. Hi, Fred student. So I'm Tylee Storcy Patros. I'm a Spanish teacher here in the high school. So I'll see you in, you know, so, uh, quite a few years. But uh, I just wanted to say that this is a great um, time that I'm going to be able to spend with you all. And um, if you were to identify a, a black or brown person who has influenced you, um, if you could tell us who they are and, and uh, a little bit about who they are and, and why. Ah, I would say the the two black people <laughs> that have influenced me the most would be my mother and my father. Uh, my father, he grew up down south um, in Arkansas, and he actually went to a school that was uh, segregated. So he went to a school that was all black students. And uh, so he's often talked with um, us about this opportunity to, to be... Um, in a multicultural environment and what that means. And then um, my mom, you know, she's a, now a retired teacher, but she taught in Rochester City School District. And one of the things that I loved about growing up in our household was that even though we didn't learn about a lot about black history in school, I always had lessons at home. I always had parents that, um, had a sense of pride in who they were and where they came from. And um, so I would say my parents are my, my best role models. Um, I followed in my mother's uh, footsteps um, to become an educator. And uh, my father also was an educator at MCC for about 10 years after he retired from being a chemist at Kodak. Um, so I've always followed followed in their footsteps. So when you when you have a really good example at home, you have someone that says, you know, I've done this, I've accomplished these things in life, uh, it, it really helps you to dream big. So I think my parents, they always instilled in me that I could dream big. I, I didn't accomplish what my parents did. My dad was number one in his high school class and number one in his college class. So that was something he always kind of held, you know, towards us and said, you know, I was amazing. You can be amazing, too. So that that was kind of hard to live up to that. But um, and my mom, I think she was in her top 10 in her uh, high school. Uh, but I I really enjoyed um, enjoyed their example. Uh, beyond that, I would say that um one person that I'm really looking at a lot now is uh, the poet Amanda Gorman and that beautiful poem that she wrote. And I really think you all should read that and, um, and think about what that means for you. Hi, I'm Mr. Mitchell. I'm the social worker here at 12 Corners Middle School and Brighton High School. Who is a black or brown change maker? that's impacted you. Tell us a little bit about them and mm -hmm. why. Sure, sure. Um, by far, by far, the um, uh, change maker in my life, it's been my great, uh, my great grandparents and my grandparents within my uh, family system. Um, one that I, when I was thinking about this question, um, my great grandmother, um, who I was close uh, with when I was young, um, just knowing a little bit more of her history and, and, and some of the other family um, pieces. Um, she sent three sons off to fight in World War um, II. And um, those sons would never return the way they left. She believed in our country. They believed in our country so much in the United States and the freedom for all after the, um, the tyranny or injustice of um, the, the, the axis of Nazi Germany and um, also um, the things of the Japanese Empire at that time were um, doing throughout the world. And she said, hey, look, I support you boys going over. Even though they were drafted, she supported and wrote letters and participated and supported the um, um, USO and some other things as, um, as a mother. Um, but two of the sons would return 
not in the best of shape after battle, and one would um, would pass away and die in in Germany and battling for our nation. Um, and I had another other grandparents that have just shown just through cultural things. Um, from singing and dancing and foods and celebration and the embrace of love um, and just how to be a, a young man, how to conduct yourself, um, the small things to from the, the Christmases and a lot of the holidays. And just I looked up to those people because even though there were some hardships that many of us uh, of um, of a different color have faced, and I clearly have seen even in my lifetime, it didn't matter. You needed to move on and be the best person that you could be, and you can have fun doing that in a lot of ways, and to love others, and that just really just uh, is a word I'm going to use, resonates with me, and still gives me to push on to my own children, and now as I'm an opa, and pass that on to my own um, grandchildren. But also inspiring me, if it had to be somebody outside of my family system, was a hockey player from Canada, and he was the first um, black hockey player ever. And I'm just going to change out of that because it's going to be with my favorite hockey team, which is the Boston Bruins. Go Bears. Okay, so I'm going to change my microphone a little bit because I have to get in to here. One second here. Okay. Uh. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you for sticking with me here for a second as I go through these things. And the player is called Willie O'Ree. He currently lives, he's retired now. It's, he um, came into the NHL, National Hockey League, in 1958. Okay. And um, we're celebrating in Boston on February 18th. is the first day that he played NHL as the first black man to play in the National Hockey, um, in the Hockey League for the Boston Bruins. Now, this is a book that Willie has um, written recently. And um, he didn't look this old when he started playing. <laughs> but from La Mesa, California, he's coming. He's going to have his, um, his uh, number 22 retired in the, um, in the new uh, TD Center, the Boston Garden, or whatever you want to call it, in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, this is significant because Boston is notoriously known for a racist community in some ways. And it was a big thing on that night for a black man to play in an area where blacks weren't necessarily allowed. And on that, that, that night, when he completed his first game, the Boston Garden gave him a huge ovation because they knew what it looked to, to overcome. He was a, really an overcomer. Um, he would only play maybe another year for the Boston, um, the Boston Bruins, but still what he did as being the only man, person of color around at that time um, to be in that community and um, and to persevere, kind of like in baseball, which you've heard of Jackie Robinson. Well, this is what the National Hockey League's version of, um, of uh, Jackie Robinson is. And I was about six years ago, I had a chance to meet with my son, Willie O'Ree, and had a picture with him. I'm sorry I don't have him, a picture of him with me here today to, to show you. I couldn't find that over the weekend. But I encourage you, um, if you want to read something really good, Willie O'Ree's book, and it's, it's, it's new, and it just gives... Um, a lot of his history and some the hardships he did and all the joy it was um, to be who he is right now. He's an ambassador for the game, and he's often in the Rochester area speaking to a lot of um, um, different children on what he has done in his life. So that is um, that was a person that's outside of my family system that I look up to. And, of course, he's a, he was a Boston Bruin, and I'm a Boston Bruin fan. <laughs> I am Jessica Cordova. I am a Fres fifth grade teacher. Hi guys, and this is her dad. <laughs> I am Jesse Carden. This is my youngest baby girl. I am officially retired, but not quite. And uh, I'm glad I got the opportunity to talk to you. Who is a black or brown change maker that's impacted you? Um, if you could tell us a little bit about who they are, just so our audience knows. Okay. And also about why they were the, the, the person that influenced you. I'll let you go first. Hmm. Um, so my fifth grade crew, room 216, you know who you are. <laughs> they know that I adore and cherish Michelle Obama. Um, for me, um, and she was former first lady, she's Barack uh, Obama's wife, but she's so much more than that too. 
Um, she's talented in just her ways of um, being and speaking. Um, she's a lawyer. Um, she's a mom. And she's just so... Her essence just glows because she knows who she is. She's confident in who she is. And she cares for others. And I relate to that because I think I have a very empathetic heart. And so looking at um, how Michelle Obama was raised, um, very like traditional family um, with her mom and her dad and her brother. And knowing how hard she worked and she knew she had to work hard. Um, and then seeing where she is now and the influence that she has across the world, yes. um, it's amazing. And so when Barack Obama took office, for me at that time, I think I was 24, um, it was amazing to see this beautiful family, this black family at, in the White House, and then how Michelle carried herself, um, knowing that there was a lot of scrutiny um, I just think her strength, her wisdom, her grace, and um, her format and her platform of wanting Americans to be healthy and having the, the White House garden be America's garden and why is that important and bringing in those things into all the different schools around the area, um, it's just phenomenal. And so I love her and... Um, the kids will say sometimes, this is Grover, you look like her. And that is a high praise compliment that I will always take and cherish. But um, that's a change maker who yeah. I strive to to be like and to continue uh, her work with um, just being who you are, caring for others, and being proud of who you are as well. Wow. It's pretty powerful, babe. <laughs> because for me the individual will always be the same. Uh, you can't tell it because I'm wearing a pin here. That means that I'm associated with a particular fraternity that I pledged when I was in college between 1969 and 73. And the name of that fraternity is Alpha Phi Alpha, founded by four, no, sorry, it's founded by seven men in 2006 at Cornell University. Fast forward, from that point, 60 years. And my, the person who most impressed me, the person who most influenced how I thought I could make a difference was Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Now, that may sound pretty typical, but for me, there was a difference. He was first a preacher, and so was my dad. And so, there was a credit, there was a, there was an accomplishment that he had achieved before the country got to know him as Martin Luther King Jr., MLK. Forty years after his assassination in 2008, Barack Obama was elected to be the President of the United States. So April 4th, 1968, I was 17. And that's the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. And many Americans, not just black, but many Americans, felt such a, a crush of their hopes. I know my parents did. And there was a pretty violent response to that when it happened, which sounds kind of familiar to those of us here in 2021, when you reflect back on the last few years, doesn't it? It's okay. It happens for us 40 years ago. One man's death changed the way we started to look at one another. But then if you fast forward to 2020, there's another man's death, George Floyd, who for me just seemed like the continuation of an, an old story. And how do we get there? But as Jessica mentioned, the reason why this fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha was my choice was because I couldn't even become a member of it until I had a certain grade point average, which for us was above 3.5, which means we weren't just there by mistake. You know, we got in because 
we were thinkers and doers, and uh, that had to carry me through the rest of my career. Because in most of the rooms that you go into now, and I went into in the business world, I was one of very few. When you start at the 70s and move forward to at least uh, the late 90s. But that didn't change the fact that I still had to be prepared. I had to somehow be different so that the stereotype that the media tends to portray doesn't dissolve who Martin Luther King really was. Uh, my name is Christopher Ross. I've lived in Brighton for about six years now, and I have a, a daughter who's a second grader at Council Rock. Um, I'm originally from California, and I work as a nurse. If you could identify a black or brown person that's been an inspiration to you and tell us a little bit about who they are and also why they were important in your life. Well, I mean, I feel like around Black History Month that we tend to um, talk about the same figures over and over again. So you know, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Um, and it, I've, I've always thought that um, I think we need to focus more on what regular people have done over the, um, the centuries to um, fight for uh, justice and equality and so forth um, and to resist oppression. Um, and so a lot of those stories are not captured, but I think that's important to know for students to know that, you know, black people were not enslaved passively that, you know, even on the first uh, slave ships that were leaving Africa, that, um, Africans resisted. They fought against the slave, uh, the crews on the slave ships, overthrew them, and returned to Africa. You know, you, that you had, um, and it's people once they arrived here who were enslaved, did things to resist um, their oppression. So you had black people who were picking cotton, picking cotton, I should say. And, you know, at the end of the day, they put a few rocks in the bag to make it seem like it was heavier. You know, we, so it was, <laughs> yeah, yes, I did all the work. I've got your 50 pounds here when actually it's 10 pounds of cotton and 40 pounds of rocks. So um, there's different ways that we were able to resist. And I think we need to think about those things for, for kids that ordinary people can do extraordinary things to resist um, uh, oppression. You know, there's, you know, slaves also ran away. You know, there, we talk about Harry Tubman um, taking people away to the north, um, but slaves ran away as soon as they got got to America. Many formed communities that were independent in the south, um, in the valleys, in the forests, in the mountains of the south. Um, these are stories we don't really talk about, you know, but this is what happened. There's ways that people resisted. Um, there was, you know, also slave sabotaged equipment on the on the plantations you know they would break uh, implements or maim um animals to so they wouldn't have to do the work of that the, the the enslavers were asking them to do um and then even after slavery when the ku klux klan was coming you, you know blacks again did not passively accept this kind of terror they fought back um and uh you know and then you have you know kind of more simple things we talk about rosa parks who didn't want to get up off uh, out of her seat you know, that was not the initial instance of that. You know, there's the historical record is uh, replete with instances of, of African-Americans refusing to um, accept second class citizenship, that they wouldn't go through the back door, that they would go sit on the front, uh, the front of the bus. And they knew the risks that were involved with that, that it's going to probably have a police presence and they're probably going to throw it off the bus and they may get thrown in jail or they may get seriously hurt or killed. But so there were ways that we were expressing our humanity, our dignity, and showing the world that we were not going to take any of the second class citizenship, you know, sitting down. So I say all that to say, again, that it doesn't have to be someone who's famous, a Martin Luther King, a Harriet Tubman, a Rosa Parks, uh, a Barack Obama, um, who is, is leading. You can lead yourself. You can take action upon yourself to... Um, fight for justice, fight for equality, fight for freedom. And it doesn't need, you don't need to be in a history book to make that happen. And you don't need to wait for a leader to lead you to that. You can do that on your own.